I'm actually going to move over here because that's where I start the piece later. So we have to keep it special. Um, so yes, like Jane said, my name is Tina Marie Custer. And for those of you that have known me for a long time, you're probably wondering why the name changed. Um, basically, in the underground street dance scene, I have been going by Tina Marie, um, which some of you may know is uh, she was a very famous soul singer. And she was also white. So as one of my mentors put it, you're a white girl with soul. Why don't you just keep that name? So I've been going by that um, as a B-girl for about 15 years now. And uh, before, I was going as Tina Cooster in my academic life at OSU. So I had to now put both of those worlds together because they have come together. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I want to thank Jane D'Angelo and also the rest of the Ohio Dance um, Committee or board for inviting me. Ohio is definitely my dance home, so I feel really honored to be back here. Like Jane said, I went to OSU, and I just want to thank all of the OSU faculty for all of their mentoring and support over the years, um, especially being encouraging when I was trying to put hip-hop on the concert stage and made some pretty horrible pieces trying to do that. Um, it took many years to figure that out because no one was really doing it at the time besides, you know, Rennie Harris and people like that. Um, and then also while I was here in Columbus getting my MFA in performance, I was training in modern and ballet during the day and then at night I would go out with the guys and break in some hallway somewhere on OSU's campus or at a community center or Bernie's if anyone knows about that place on High Street. Um, and that was, you know, every Sunday night it was like hip hop church. So I really came up in the ranks of the, the breaking scene here in Columbus um, and felt like I had two identities for a long time. So when I got the job at Slippery Rock and moved away um, and moved back to Pittsburgh, I really started to figure out how these two worlds can sort of combine. So those of you that, that took the contemporary class yesterday, you might have gotten a little bit of that. Um, but my main goal as an artist is to explore street dance vocabulary and see how I can use that in a different context to talk about whatever I want to talk about. In this case, it's social media and selfies. But we'll get to that. Um, so the, the, the mini lecture I'm going to do today before I do a, a short performance, um, I do this around the country, usually with my crew, and it's called Get Rooted, Get Rooted with Venus Fly. Venus Fly is the first all-female, all-style crew in the country, definitely in the Midwest. Um, and the reason that we founded it 10 years ago is because we would go to jams, meaning underground street dance jams, and we would keep seeing each other, but it might only be two or three of us. Um, there aren't many females still in the underground street dance scene. So we felt like we needed support and encouragement from each other, even though we lived in all different cities. So we have 10 members now. Um, there is one not pictured there, and he's actually our first guy that we put down. But he does Vogue, so he kind of fits in with this whole female, feminine thing, um, which is why we decided to put a male down with us finally. So we live in Nashville, Las Vegas, Chicago, um, Minneapolis, I'm in Pittsburgh. So we're spread out all over the country, but we meet periodically to battle together and just um, kind of improvise and get down. So I just want to give a shout out to them since they're not here, but um, we can go ahead and move to the next slide. And we're gonna talk a little bit about women in hip hop. So most of you probably use hip hop as a word that describes the dance style of hip hop. And I just went to a conference in Los Angeles with Ken Swift. Ken Swift is one of the most legendary b-boys in hip-hop culture. And he said, hip-hop is the most misused word in terms of using it to describe a dance style. And it's, it's a culture. So that would be like me saying, I do Mexican. <laughs> you do Mexican what? Food, clothing, you get what I'm saying. Um, so we're going to just kind of describe what, what is hip-hop culture. All of these different things fall under that umbrella of hip hop culture. So there's music, you have the Mercedes Ladies, which were the first uh, MC, female MC group. I'm sure you've heard of MC Light, those of us that are a little older. Um, Jean Grey is, has been pretty hot for the last 10 years in the underground hip hop scene. And we'll go ahead and show this clip, Rodney, of Saw Rock, who is a really amazing female MC from Atlanta.
the audible version of tissues forming organisms like particles splitting the volatile be wary of me the spawn of the sun and the earth you born on hollow ground messed around and open up the goddamn portal splitting they call me DC cause I'm creasing rappers on their turf and plot for hopes to call me later say I hardly spoke cause I'm a quiet and a sad so a passion for fire blaze the trails and leave the victims catch a breath inside the smoke this is the revival that the five of rap hard of city a pin of making street survival rap hard and gritty a lost man with a swag he can't master Cast from the blast of the Elohim, God is with me. I spark fear in their hearts with 50,000 watts of light beams from out the deepest chasms of the darkness. These words I leave my mark and they say they can't mark me. But these is gemstones, metal cut, laying in gold copper, laying in so proper. I enunciate the doctrine, taking converts. You wonder why my name is so popular. I came from a jungle made of concrete and concrete. Lions and the tigers and the bears have us hostage. Where I learned the difference between authentic and imposters. Where I turn my sentences to loaded guns and cock them. There I stayed alone, me where I sinister the monsters. Now I'm playing figures in the center of a marsh pit. I mean, what the hell is that? I'm the buddy. center of your conscience, the black dot, honey skin, the pinnacle of progress, the future of music. So, yeah, give it up for her. She's amazing. Um, and the beautiful thing about her, too, is she's a mother. So when you go to her shows, her kids are running around on the stage, and she's just, like, doing her thing. It's really beautiful. Um, but a lot different than what we see in the media, right? With Nicki Minaj and, and people like that. Um, so I'm going to really go into the dance portion, obviously, of hip-hop culture, so we'll save that. Um, for graffiti writing, we have Lady Pink down there at the bottom. That's one of her pieces. Um, she was really popular back in the 70s and 80s in New York. Um, production. Some of you may have heard of Sylvia Robinson. She produced Sugar Hill Gang uh, back in the 70s in Harlem. Um, we have Lauren Hill, who did a lot of her own production, and probably uh, one of the newest and kind of up-and-coming women are, is, is Wonder Girl. She's from Canada. Um, we have beatboxing. Look up Butterscotch and Simph. Um, I'm not going to go through all the links today because we don't have a lot of time, but um, she just won the, I think it's the UK Beatbox Championships or something like that. She was really amazing. Um, and then for fashion, we have Kimora Lee and uh, Walker Wear. Um, and then promoting, we have Cool Lady Blue and Asia One. Promoting is basically, you know, are you organizing a hip hop group to travel around the country? Are you hosting a jam um, that has, you know, an all style battle or a b-boy battle, things like that. So we'll go ahead and move to next, the next slide. So uh, one of the first and original hip hop dances is called rocking. And in this style, it comes out of Latin social dance because this was happening in New York. You had a lot of Puerto Ricans. Um, and Dominicans, you know, doing the dances they were already doing, like salsa and mambo, etc. And they, but the music was changing. It was funk music, so they the dance started to change. And we'll go ahead and roll this clip, this <laughs> clip, Rodney. So this is a duet version of rocking. It's obviously a little choreographed, but you get the idea. There's also a style of it called up rocking, where you do it against a partner. It's a little more aggressive than that. You're actually shooting them and stabbing them, you know, pantomime version <laughs> of that. Um, yeah, so we'll go ahead and move to the next slide. Yes, weaponless dance battles. That's what it looks like. 
So now we're at b-boying or b-girling. This is also original hip-hop dance style that started in the early 70s at Cool Herc's parties in the Bronx. So what Cool Herc would do was basically have a record player and have you know, whatever was famous at the time, probably James Brown or something like that, and he would put a record on. When it would get to the break of the record, which is when the vocals drop out and it's just the percussion, People would go out in the circle one by one and do this, you know, kind of posturing, posing, and then they might go down to the floor and then come up, and then eventually they stay <coughs> down on the floor. So those people were called b-boys or b-girls, which is the name of the style of dance that I've trained in for the last 15 years. Um, I'll show you the, the blueprint of it here in a minute. Um, so there's top rock, go down, footwork, and freeze. There are also power moves. And you can do all five in one run, or you could just maybe do two or three things. But you have to be, you have to be doing these things in order to be breaking. Um, so I'll show you just a little bit. Top rock. Go down. Famous B girls, Headspin Janet, isn't that the best name ever? <laughs> Baby Love, Honey Rockwell, and Rockefeller, who is one of my mentors. These were all some of the first B girls coming out of New York. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Another part of hip hop is party or social dances. Who can name a party dance that you all know now? Just yeah. call it out. Yeah. A dab. <laughs> 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 what else? What are some other ones? Okay, great. So these change as much as your outfits every year, right? Every party you go to in every couple months, there's a new one out. Um, so I grew up in the 80s and 90s, which is what we call the New Jack Swing era of music. So that was basically gospel and hip hop and R&B kind of all mixed into one. And the dances were really high energy. I get really jealous of your generation because you get to just go like this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we were like this. <laughs> it was exhausting. Um, but one of my biggest inspirations growing up was watching the Fly Girls on In Living Color. So I'm hearing some oohs and ahs in the audience, so I think we need to watch this clip. Yeah. See if you can find J-Lo. Oh. I want to do this for a living. I didn't know what that meant, but um, that was definitely a huge inspiration for me. Also, I went to my first hip hop concert and it was MC Light, and she had two dancers named Leg One and Leg Two. <laughs> two really tall, buff guys that would just kill it at, you know, backing her up at the shows. And I just thought, one, wow, she's really badass. <laughs> but also that she has these men dancing for her. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go into funk styles. So locking. Locking is a style that came out of the late 60s, early 70s, and it got spread through the show called Soul Train. And uh, uh, some basic moves for this would be throwbacks, or the lock, points, wrist rolls, etc. So uh, some really famous women that danced locking back in the day, because it was a lot of men doing this style. I would just say for all the styles I'm talking about today, they're very male dominated. Um, Davida Jo Freeman, who danced with James Brown, if you look at old footage of her on the Soul Train show, she's doing that. And we're gonna um, go to the bottom link, Rodney, and that's gonna be Anna Lollipop Sanchez. She's doing a blend of locking and whacking. Whacking's a style that came out of Los Angeles after locking, mostly from the gay community. So you'll see her doing both. Thank you. 
so I think we should be now at popping. Yes, we'll go to the next slide. So what was happening is in the early 70s in New York, you had hip hop culture being born. So that's the breaks. Those were Cool Herc's parties where he would get one turntable um, and, and another turntable and extend the break of one record to the next record so that the, the b-boys and b-girls would stay out in the circle longer. So even though both coasts were listening to the same music, they were interpreting it completely differently. So in New York, if they heard James Brown, they had that sort of salsa, mambo influence. And then on the West Coast, they're hearing James Brown, but they're doing this. What do you see that's in both of those? Did you notice? The rocking action of my back, right? So that's funk, that's funk music right there. Just this, this easy rock that keeps the beat of the music all the time. And you see it in all the funk styles. Um, so we're gonna go to popping now. Everyone gets to try this. You're gonna stick your arms out in front of you, both of them, and just squeeze as hard as you can. And then release. And do that again. Squeeze and release. Now do it really fast. Squeeze, release, squeeze, release. See my tricep over there? <laughs> you can train any muscle in your body to pop. Why don't you try your neck? Pretend you saw something really gross on the floor and you're like, ugh. Right? So you tense up your neck and then release it. Now do that really fast. And without the face. <laughs> so any muscle can do that. Abdominals, legs. And that's what poppers train for years to do so that you get this sort of uh, jerk around the joints. And Boogaloo Sam invented this style and he just walked around the house saying popping. That's why we call it popping. He could have said anything would be doing that. Um, boogalooing also goes with popping. Boogalooing is basically your upper body going away from your lower body. So it looks like this. Um, and a lot of people will pop and boogaloo at the same time. Um, a famous group from Fresno, California, which is where this is invented, are called the Electric Boogaloos. So you can look them up um, to see more of what that style is. But we're talking about ladies. So um, down at the bottom we have Peaches from New York City, Medusa, and then Pringles and Pandora are both in my crew. They're some of the first female poppers outside of New York. So Pringles is definitely the first female popper in the Midwest. She lives in Kansas City. And Pandora came up in the scene in LA but now lives in Las Vegas. And let's go ahead and show the bottom clip, I think. So this is Pringles just doing a judge's showcase. Maybe you can shut the other windows too, that might help. Yeah, we don't need those anymore.
we would call an underground street dance jam. Um, although they're not so underground to anymore, that was probably at a, a university somewhere. A lot of university uh, hip hop crews or organizations are starting to host these now, so it's you know less at a dark, grimy club. Those still happen too, but um, getting more a little, a little more accessible. All right, let's move on to, I think we have house next. Oh, okay, so the, the fusion of funk and hip-hop I was talking about, they're on two different coasts, right? So early 70s, you have popping and locking on the West Coast, and then you have breaking on the East Coast. So what happened in the 80s is you had MTV, and this was the first time that you started seeing dancers in music videos. But what was happening is a lot of the dancers were not street dance trained. They were trained in jazz or modern or something like that, and the choreographers were hired that were also modern and jazz dancers. But they would want that street dance look. So they might, you know, steal a couple moves from the street dancers and then you started having this whole different uh, sort of watered down hip hop version um, that I would like to just call commercial dance now. Some people call it choreo or hip hop choreo, um, which is totally different than training in these, you know, specific styles. Um, so MTV was kind of what, what spurred that to happen. So now you have two different cultures happening at the same time. You have students that go to a dance studio and they learn hip hop and facing a mirror and doing you know, exact choreography because they want to get hired in the commercial industry. And then you have the underground street dancers that go to a dirty club somewhere and get in the cypher, which is an open freestyle circle and freestyle. So if both of those people are saying hip hop dancer, they're saying they're hip hop dancers, you see how that might be confusing. Um, so MTV was definitely the, the, the start of all that. So we have the video dancer being born, um, but also hip hop dancing culture started to be spread internationally. So now you have b-boys in Korea, in China, in Japan. Um, you have whackers that are doing it better than people in the US now. <laughs> um, so it's really become a global culture. So let's go ahead and move to house and, oh yeah, oh, prepping. So these are styles, breaking, breaking, popping, locking, and boogalooing are all definitely considered under the umbrella of hip hop. This was where it gets a little sticky. When you start moving into other styles, some people say that's not hip hop anymore, it's something else. Crumping is one of those. I've talked to some um, croppers in LA, and a lot of them say, we're not hip hop, we are our own thing. We have our own culture. Um, so we're gonna keep going because of time, but you should look up Miss Prissy. She is definitely one of the female pioneers of, of that style. Um, also house dance. House dance started in Chicago in the gay clubs on the south side of Chicago. New York also has its own uh, lineage of house dance. But uh, this is a style that is related to hip hop, but it's not necessarily under the umbrella of hip hop because it's done to house music, which is totally different. And the culture is about love and spirituality and it's not very aggressive, you don't usually battle in it. Um, but the reason I put it in here is because nowadays, uh, the rise of all style battles is happening. So what that means is all of these styles, you could be a crumper, popper, you know, whatever, and you start to battle each other at these all style events. So if I go out to battle someone and they put on funk music, that's gonna tell me what to do. I'm probably gonna lock or whack or, or pop because that's what the music goes to. But if they play house music, I should probably know how to house a little bit. So now dancers are training in everything so that they're well-rounded. What happens is you don't really get good at anything. So I feel like that's a shift that's happened in the street dance community. Um, so we'll go ahead and watch that bottom clip and that'll be probably the last one of Marjorie Smart, and she passed away last year. <laughs>
Ronnie, we'll go ahead and cut that, even though I hate you. Oh, isn't she just beautiful? It was a huge loss for the community to, um, to lose her last year of cancer. And um, she was really one of the first females in New York that brought a feminine um, expression to her dancing, because most of it was men doing really fast footwork. It was very precise. and. Um, she just allowed herself to dance like she wanted to express herself, which was, you know, I think groundbreaking for all of us females in the street dance scene. Um, so we'll go ahead to the last, uh, the last slide. So now we are at hip hop and the theater. So we have all of these underground styles that became really popular, and now people are starting to choreograph them and put them on the stage. Um, so one of the first companies, Ghetto Original had Rockefeller and Honey Rockwell in it, two historic B-girls. Um, and you might remember the name or the show called Jam on the Groove, which was one of the first Broadway, hip-hop Broadway shows. We'll go ahead to the next slide. And now you have companies like Rennie Harris, who's been around for 20 plus years, making work on the concert stage. Um, I don't know if anyone has seen Company Wong Ramirez. They're amazing. What they, what they say they do, though, is contemporary dance. They don't describe it as hip-hop dance theater, which is a term that Rennie Harris coined to describe hip-hop on the concert stage. Um, so I thought that was really interesting that they're from Germany and they don't like to be labeled as that. Even though clearly in their work there isn't a fusion of modern dance or anything like that. It's, it's straight street dance. Um, so now we have this new genre of, con of concert dance called hip hop dance theater, and now there are these big festivals all over the world. Uh, Breaking Convention is probably the largest one in London. I've been there to perform once. Um, hip hop dance theater festival, San Francisco hip hop dance theater festival. And what's really cool now is that a lot of b-boys and street dancers are starting to want to train in composition, um, which most of them have had no training in because they're street dancers. So we're seeing this crossover between the concert dance community and the street dance community. And then go ahead to the last slide. So these are just some hip hop resources. If you want to write those down or take a picture or whatever. Um, so most of my information comes from primary sources, people that are still alive and can just tell me about their experiences like Mr. Wiggles and Rockefeller. Um, so I feel really, really privileged to be able to do that. Uh, because they're starting to pass on now. So, as we just had Prince yesterday, very sad, yeah. Um, so any questions before we get into the choreographic part of this? Okay, just let that simmer, we'll come back to it. So I'm gonna introduce the film that we're gonna show. I've been touring a piece called My Good Side for the last year. And it's a solo, one-woman, hip-hop dance theater show um, that's interactive, so you will need your phones out later. Um, but this film is in the show, and it's also been touring around the festival, film festival circuit for the last year also. I made this with my best friend, Erica Randall, who is also an OSU grad. Her and her husband produced and directed it. And my idea was that I just wanted to play as many different characters with different gender expressions as possible because when you break, it's really masculine. When you whack, it's super feminine. So it already brings about a certain, you know, different character aspects to it. So I wanted to push myself, you know, performance-wise with that. Um, and then just showcase all the skills that I've been training in with all these different styles over the years. So here it is, down for the count.
All right, so that is part of the show where I get to change costume and catch my breath. <laughs> um, but it kind of moves the, the story along. Um, the next part you're going to see is called Instaglam, and it's another excerpt from the longer show, which is about 40 minutes. And uh, this, well, the whole piece came about because of my love and hate relationship with social media. Um, does anyone else have that? <laughs> so, um, when I was coming up as a B-girl, YouTube came out. Some of you were probably just born, right? Um, so when YouTube started, I was battling a lot. And people would take video of you, whether you wanted them to or not, and they would post it. And then people would just rip you apart. They would say horrible things about you. This was my first experience with cyberbullying. Um, and it really, you know, it kind of broke my spirit. I didn't want to dance anymore. I felt like I can't do anything right. You know, every time I go somewhere, someone's going to be critiquing me really harsh, um, really harshly. So I decided that I needed to tackle this issue because I wasn't posting anything on social media. And as an independent artist, you have to. <laughs> That's how we promote. So um, I had a couple good friends of mine say, you really have to get over this. And just everyone's doing it. Just put your stuff out there. Um, so I decided to make a piece about it instead to deal with that. So uh, this is just kind of poking fun at our narcissism of why we post what we do. Do you only post when you have makeup on? Um, do you want to show who you're with or where you are? What is important to you? And kind of I'm, I'm more interested in the psychology of why we post things. So Instagram. A different video than usual and I'm actually going to be doing um, how to take the perfect selfie. So the first tip is to actually look decent in real life. Chances are if you look good like in real life you'll look good on camera even probably even better because you know you have that camera quality in you you know. But yeah so um, just try to look as decent as you can try to like fix your makeup or whatever because if you look better in real life then you'll look good on camera too. Don't look ugly, basically. <laughs> Taking selfies, you know what I'm saying? Right. Tip number two is to take your selfies in front of a good natural lighting. I'm actually in front of two windows right now. This is actually where I take my selfies, but this door right here, like I'll show you. But yeah, so natural lighting looks a hundred bazillion times better than ugly lighting. Like, okay, you will look good, okay? It doesn't even matter what you look like. You will look nice. The phone is higher and like you're lower, it'll look nicer, makes your face look all nice and defined and, you know, pretty, you know what I'm saying? So you take it like that and then do whatever face you, you're comfortable with. Um, boys tend to take it like their selfies like down here, like I have selfies on there. People don't want to make yourself look uglier than you actually are. That is not, that's not good. You want to make yourself uglier, do you? Tip number four is the poses that you do, okay? So this is actually an issue for like a lot of people, but just do what you're comfortable with. I'm usually comfortable with like, like not smiling with my teeth because my like mouth goes crooked. Like when I smile, I it's I have an issue with my smile because that's why they're fixing it. So I tend to smile with my mouth closed, and that's how I think I look nice. If you think you look nice, like smiling with your teeth, then smile with your teeth. You have a pretty smile, smile with your teeth because. I'm jealous of you, but if you have a pretty smile, like, I'm jealous, okay? 
tip number five is actually how you edit your selfies, like how you edit the picture. What up? What up? How do you do that? Even I mean, if you edit it like super, super, like ooh, all pretty, like with all these filters and like all this, like your whole face is blurred. If the picture, like the original picture, isn't nice, it's not gonna turn out as good as it can be. Let's begin, shall we? First, remove your telephones from your trousers, your handbags. Go ahead, I'll wait. Turn your cameras on. Bring your wrist together. Go ahead and let them touch. And now go ahead and bring your knees toward your chest. And then you could even let the legs cross. How are you doing? I bet you're fabulous. Now capture your self-portrait. Capture another self-portrait. Next, open your Twitter. Open your Twitter and post to at feminine exhale. Again, post to at feminine exhale. If you don't have Twitter, it's already been 20 minutes. Shouldn't you check your Facebook feed? Or maybe you could text the person next to you. While you're posting to at feminine exhale. I'm going to go get ready for the next section. Okay, how about hands up to the face? Yeah, and let's go ahead and let the wrist touch. There you go. That's beautiful already. Can your head fall slightly this way? Let's still roll this way. Beautiful. Chin up just a tiny bit right there. It's lovely. Lovely. Maybe just falling a little bit more, really, really kind of soft and breathy. Yeah. Eyes closed and beautiful, yeah. Try the same idea, but really pull those shoulders down. So the yeah, long, long neck. Gorgeous. Let's get and keep that hand close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful with one folded that way. Just roll your face up toward me. Even a little bit more. Almost like you're basking in this kind of heavenly feeling light. Turn this shoulder straight on to me though. You would, yeah, beautiful. Good, eyes closed. Let's let the hand that's on the inside roll all the way open. Actually, just maybe touching the wrist is pretty, but let the hand be open a little bit more there, beautiful. Let your weights fall to the side a little bit, so your weight, there we go, beautiful. So pretty. If you would just look deadpan right at me, 
where I started to really get my training. Um, it really is hard to hear people say that hip-hop dancers aren't trained because we train just as many hours. It's just not as structured. Um, we don't go to class for it. So yeah, I would come up in the under-21 dance clubs in Pittsburgh, and that's when I started uh, freestyling, battling, um, but it wasn't really until I got to Columbus for grad school that I started to train really deeply in these styles. Um, that's when I got into the breaking scene and I started to go train with the pioneers in New York, LA, etc. Well, I definitely don't post, uh, or I, I guess I don't read it. 
So if I go to a battle, I don't look for my video to come up and then see what people wrote. So there's that. But um, also I'm just older, so I feel like there probably is less of that because of the age group that I know. So maybe I'll ask the young ladies here, do you guys still have a, um, some experience with that, cyberbullying? Anyone want to talk about it? Yeah? No? But it's there. I see your head's nodding. Yeah. Anything else? Just to promote themselves as an artist, kind of. I think to, everyone's different, and some people are totally fine with that, and they want to put their whole lives online, and some people just use it for artistic purposes to promote their art. So yeah, I don't judge anyone for it, but I just know personally I had a really hard time with it, and I still do. Absolutely. I mean, I made myself get on Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> Snapchat, everything, so that I could see what it was, because I felt like I was judging something that I didn't really know anything about, just because I was shy to use it. Um, and I've definitely gotten over the stigma a lot of posting. So, yeah, I think it's helped me. Hi, John Giffen. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I've, I've worked for a long time to try to get there. <laughs> so for a while, all I could do was comment on the culture itself on the concert stage, and I had to, because I, I didn't want to not be real, you know? There's a lot of pressure to be real from the pioneers um, of these styles, and so I had to let that go and just say, what do I, Tina Marie, as an artist, as a woman, uh, want to say with this vocabulary, and it doesn't take anything away from when I go out and, and battle and compete in that world, it's still the same. I just had to allow it to change um, when it got to the stage, so thank you. Anything else? Are we out of time, Jane? I think we're getting close. Okay, great. Anyone have one last question? And we'll wrap it up. This is definitely an orally passed down dance style, like every you know form coming from the African diaspora, like um, John was saying, with these social dances that just keep transforming every decade. Um, but I think that this was a lot of personal experience, but it is more documented now than it ever has been, with a lot of the pioneers starting to, to pass on or get into their 60s. and people are starting to freak out and say, oh, we need to write this down before they leave this, you know, leave this world, so, yeah. And I thank you for your female perspective on this. Thank you. We've heard what the men have to say. Yes. And there are many kind of histories out there, but I certainly appreciate the, uh, your perspective. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.